Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. I hope that you have been having a lovely Easter, whether that's spring and you're in the Northern Hemisphere or like us here in the South, enjoying that autumn turn as the nights start to get a bit colder and we're pulling out all of our jackets. This week, it's school holidays and normally in school holidays, I will replay one of our popular podcast episodes. But I was asked a question recently and I thought, oh, I will put together an episode to reply to that question. And it was quite simply, you know, Sophia, do you have any podcasts about meltdowns because my child has had this massive meltdown and they're really feeling a lot of anger and they've got these unrealistic expectations of themselves and perfectionism. And my reply to that was, well, Yes, yes, yes. There are lots of great podcasts that we've got that deal with meltdowns and perfectionism and all sorts of things. But here's an opportunity maybe to pull that together. So in today's episode, what we do is we break it down. We talk about meltdowns and oh, you've got some great snippets from Alison Davies and our podcast about what a meltdown's all about, how should we support our kids during a meltdown. We have got some great snippets in here from Emily Kircher Morris and our episode on perfectionism, Dr. Matt Zakreski when we talked about imposter syndrome, Alexandra Idens when we talked about growth mindset journal. I'm also bringing in a bit of Brene Brown uh, as we talk about perfectionism and shame and anger. And a great article from definitely one of my favorite books, Perspectives on Giftedness, Sound Advice from Parents and Professionals, which is a recent publication by GHF Press. And we have uh, interviewed a few authors from that book already. And this particular article is by Ginny Cotches called The Heartbreak of Angry Gifted Kids. So we, we go on a bit of a journey. We talk about meltdowns. We talk about anger, perfectionism what insights Dr. Matt has about imposter syndrome, because it's all about not feeling enough as who we are. And then at the end, we talk about tools and strategies and things that we can do and incorporate into our parenting to help kind of build the the muscles that we need to build uh, for our children and for ourselves to kind of overcome perfectionism and imposter syndrome. And, And we talk about emotions like anger and what they mean and what we should do with those. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Please let me know. You can find us at ourgiftedkids.com and there are great resources there. We've got a free ebook and we've got a free course. We're also on Facebook and Instagram and we've got a Facebook group. So get in touch, get involved. I would love to hear what you think of the episode, if it's helpful. And let me know if you've got any other podcast ideas or episode ideas, or if you would like to be on the podcast, I would love to hear from you. So take care, enjoy, and let me know what you think. Bye. Hi, I'm Sophia Elliott. As a parent of three gifted kids, I'm here to talk about all things gifted. Because I've been isolated and uncertain, and I felt like that parent, then I found peace of mind, support, and my community. This podcast is about sharing that journey actually parenting gifted kids and connecting with advice and support so we have everything we need for every member of our family to thrive this is the our gifted kid podcast hello and welcome to this week's episode recently a parent got in touch because they were in this situation where their child had this two-hour meltdown fueled with anger and unhappiness because they had these expectations of themselves and they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And their expectation was that they should be able to do it the first time. And it fueled this angry meltdown. And so the parent got in touch and it's like, do you have any podcasts (laughs) on perfectionism and anger and meltdowns? And We have dealt with all of those things in various podcasts, but what I thought I would do today is actually bring that together into this podcast and have a conversation about meltdowns 
about anger, about perfectionism, and what we can do as parents to support our children when we're experiencing these really challenging situations. So first of all, we're going to start with meltdowns. And the most amazing person I know who talks about meltdowns is Alison Davies. And we had her on the podcast recently. So we're going to listen to a little snippet from Alison as she tells us what a meltdown is really all about. So this is actually an opportunity to shift our perspective, our mindset as parents and educators about what is going on when a child or for that matter, an adult is experiencing a meltdown. And I think this is really important because I think there's this perception that a meltdown is controllable. It's just a temper tantrum, you know, and the person in that situation has a choice. And what we'll see from Alison is actually there is no choice in that process. The meltdown is almost just like it's required to discharge that buildup of energy. So let's have a listen to Alison as she talks us through meltdowns. I saw this beautiful meme yesterday which said meltdown and it had been crossed out, tantrum crossed out, and then underneath it it said emotional release. Yes. And that's what that's what anything like that is. An yeah. angry outburst, yeah. a child smashing a window, you know, throwing rocks at someone. I'm going all to like, you know, the big, the big <laughs> the aggressive big stuff. Yeah. yeah. So um, an adult shouting, you know. Or an hour, adult shout. So it's exactly you know, the same for children. Yep. Yeah. As adults. Yeah. And so when we are supporting, so when they are having an emotional release, it's happening. Mm. Yes. And the best thing you can do, and it's this is what what I suggest for meltdowns as well, there's two things you can do in the middle of a meltdown or an emotional release is just as best as you can remove any direct triggers. So if you know that there is a noisy thing happening or there was a flashing light happening and you can easily just turn that off and fix that trigger, well, then do that. Well, like a Don't try and micromanage the triggers, but just if there's something obvious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then the other thing is just as best as you can, make sure that everyone who's in that area is safe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't get in there and stop it while it's happening. So when the emotional release, when the angry outburst is happening, it's happening. And then as soon as it's finished, you move into the comfort stage where you tell the child they are loved, they are safe, it's okay, it's not their fault. Sometimes traditionally that's when people have gone in with punishments and like, okay, you shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. But we know that a brain that is dysregulated needs to feel safe and and loved and validated to be able to regulate. That makes so much sense. It's really hard for us adults because we are one of the first generations to know this science. So Mm -hmm. we're one of the first generations to move past what we are deeply conditioned into, Mm -hmm. which is to look at the behaviours and manage the behaviours and reward or or punish behaviors because that's what our generations have always done at school and at home. Yeah. So it's hard for us and it can be really hard after an angry outburst to then just come in with love and compassion and support. But as soon as you have then been able to reconnect and your child feels safe, then you are straight back into what I call the management stage, which is finding ways Uh, little moments in your lifestyle every day to support your little one's brain to feel safe. And that is the best way you can reduce the likelihood of them being in survival mode. So what you're doing then is helping delay the next meltdown and it's never going to stop. I'm never ever against stopping angry outbursts because Mm. we're human. So we will absolutely have them no matter what happens. But when we are consciously supporting, creating an environment for our children or finding ways to support their regulatory needs day to day when things are going fine, not when they're already going into that angry space. That's when we sort of, we end up developing a a sort of a bigger window of tolerance for them or more capacity, more resources for them before they start to get into that heightened state where they're not coping so well with their emotions. And I think probably the most important point to reiterate right now yeah is that it's really bloody hard 
Yes. Like there is nothing easy about honoring a meltdown or an angry outburst. Mm -hmm. There is nothing easy about us staying regulated and consciously in control enough to then come in and not start to discipline. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's so hard for us to come in with love. And, you know, I remember one time after a meltdown a few years ago, it was a really big one. There was like kind of three hours there of really hard work. And I had strangers, you know, other adults had to come and help me. And, you know, it wasn't my meltdown. It was a child and I had another child with me and it was in a place where it was just really awkward. It was a really, Mm. really hard one. Yeah. And at the end of that, when we could finally kind of get in the car and drive again, I went to the bakery and bought the kids treats like kiss biscuits with icing on them and it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Like I was so, like I had nothing left in me. I was so empty. I was so terrified. I was so traumatized. I was so triggered. I was, I've almost got tears remembering it. Mm. And I mean, it doesn't seem like a big deal really, but for me to drive straight from that situation to go and buy treats for them (laughs) was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I just really felt like if any other parent saw what I was doing right now, they'd be like, you're so soft on them. You should be, you know, this is your fault. You're not, you're not blah, blah, blah. It's really, really hard to be the person who understands the science and makes parenting choices based on that when you know that all around you are going to be people who only see the behaviours and Mm -hmm. only see what they perceive is the right or wrong way of you responding to that. And so it's very, very hard. It's not an easy thing, but it is the right thing. That little snippet was from Alison Davies' recent podcast episode, How Our Brains Impact Behaviour. And I'll put all of these links in the show notes in case you want to listen to the full episode. So in that snippet, Alison is helping us to reframe what a meltdown is all about. And importantly, it's what we do during and at the, at the end of the meltdown. So during that meltdown, it's just like, how can we make it safe? Because how can we let this happen and make it safe? After the meltdown, it's not coming in with shame and discipline it's coming in with love and support and helping them to process and recover. So in this next snippet, Alison talks to us about how our world today completely inundates the brain. And if you consider this within the gifted context as well, as gifted individuals, we're like raw nerves, you know, we're highly sensitive to the world already. And then we're in this highly intense modern world. So let's have a little listen to Alison as she helps us understand well, why do people end up in this meltdown situation? Okay. So behaviors, all behaviors are yeah. always, always the byproduct of what's going on in the brain. Yeah. So the first thing is whenever we focus on the behavior, so if a child is experiencing anger, And I say, I like to say experiencing anger rather than Mm. is an angry child because we know that all emotions are transient. Emotion literally means energy in motion. So it's, it's just an energy that is moving through us. It's not a state that we permanently are in. So if a child is experiencing anger, which they will, because we're all human and all of us will, however, that is externalizing behaviorally, that's not the focus. So the first thing is to move away from the focus being the hitting, the Mm -hmm. the punching, the hole in the wall, the, the, all of the, the angry sort of behaviors that we would associate and to recognize that they, their brain is in survival. Our brain goes into survival mode very quickly these days for most of us, because this modern Western world we live in is surrounded by sensory input, too much sensory input too much information, so many options, so many choices. And because of our fast paced life where there's so many expectations, so many things we're getting done, we're moving quickly to do all the things. It's just so fast that our brains are, uh, many parts of our brains are sort of in this heightened state of arousal or like high stimulated, highly stimulated. 
And that's adults and children alike, which means that some parts of our brain are going to be going overboard. The little part of the brain in right in the middle called the amygdala, which detects our threat responses. If that's highly active, we want our amygdala to pick up threats, but not like every second noise or movement mm. that wasn't expected in the room. Yeah. But if our if our brains and our children's brain, brains are highly active or overactive or highly stimulated because of all the the this modern world we live in, then their brain will be <laughs> basically jumping at all of these. There's a noise. There's something unexpected. I, I didn't, I don't know who that was. What's this? And the brain's like, okay, these are all potential threats. I'm not quite sure what to make all of, of all of this. So let's just go into survival mode to ensure you're safe because yeah. our brain's only job in the world is to keep us alive. That's its only job. So whenever it's overwhelmed, uh, it'll put us straight into survival mode just in case it's missing anything important uh, so that we have the best <laughs> chance of saving our own lives. So it sounds very dramatic, but the brain doesn't know the difference between real threats and perceived threats, which is why children will be experiencing anger. So it's always, when, you, when we understand it from that perspective, it makes so much more sense to support our children in a way that allows them to slow down allows them to feel safe that create create an environment for your child that they feel connected to you as a parent or a caregiver that they feel nurtured and loved and safe and all of those things are the things that's going to help the brain come out of survival mode so it's a complete different spin on how we manage behaviors because it's <laughs> always always been about focusing on the behavior like we don't hit yeah. So is um, it, and this is completely different. So now we're understanding why the brain ends up in this situation where it's kind of required to discharge through a meltdown. We're understanding that the world we live in it just becomes overwhelming and the brain goes into this survival mode. And when it's in this survival mode, this meltdown experience can discharge that. And so Alison has also shared with us how important it is just to make people safe when they're going through that meltdown, how to support and love them when they're coming out of that meltdown rather than going in with punishment, which may have been what has happened in the past. But now we can understand how this relates to the brain and why these behaviors are happening. We can understand that all emotions are just energy in motion and it's such a beautiful reframe to to take because sometimes it can be so easy to feel someone else's anger or frustration as this kind of personal attack on ourselves and but rather just kind of step back and go that's just them experiencing that emotion and that energy is is in motion coming out of them there is research that shows that actually we do a lot to avoid feeling emotions, but it's actually really only 90 seconds of physical discomfort that we're desperately trying to avoid. And if we can just kind of lean into that moment of discomfort and experience those emotions, we can actually move through and process them. So what we're going to talk about next is emotion. We know what a meltdown is all about. We know why that's happening. Well, let's have a little chat here about anger. And for this, I'm going to refer to, of course, my, one of my favorite authors, and that is Brene Brown. And I've got her recent book here, Atlas of the Heart, which is mapping meaningful connection and the language of human experiences. So there was some research and it showed that most folk really only could articulate three emotions, happy, sad, and angry. And if we can't articulate how we're feeling, if we can't identify our own emotions, then that's going to make it really difficult to understand what we're feeling, to communicate that, to deal with that, to process that. And so this book for her is all about identifying all the different emotions, what they are, and how we can work through those. So Brene says that anger is a full contact emotion. 
She says it activates our nervous system and can hijack our thoughts and behaviours. It can take a real toll on our mental and physical health. She says that researchers explain that regulating and coping with anger, rather than holding on to or expressing chronic anger, is crucial for the health of our brain and actually reduces psychiatric problems and the effect on other organs in the body. In Brene's Brown's research, it suggests that there can be all sorts of things behind anger. For example, fear, anxiety, frustration, confusion, grief, hurt, sadness, isolation, guilt, shame, jealousy, outrage at injustice, helplessness, overwhelming stress, humiliation, embarrassment, depression, loneliness, rejection. These can all be factors that are underlying the anger and being expressed as anger. Brene Brown also talks about how anger is a challenging emotion for us. As parents, it can be really difficult to watch our children be angry. And she talks a little bit about this in Atlas of the Heart. And I just want to read this section. She says, sometimes owning our pain and bearing witness to struggle means getting angry. When we deny ourselves a right to be angry, we deny our pain. There are a lot of coded shame messages in the rhetoric of, why so hostile? Don't get hysterical. I'm sensing so much anger. And don't take it so personally. All of these responses are normally code for, your emotion or opinion is making me uncomfortable. Or, suck it up and stay quiet. Our response to this is, get angry and stay angry. I haven't seen that advice borne out in the research. What I've found is that, yes, we all have the right and need to feel and own our anger. It's an important human experience. And it's critical to recognize that maintaining any level of rage, anger or contempt over a long period of time is not sustainable. Anger is a catalyst. Holding on to it will make us exhausted and sick. Internalizing anger will take away our joy and spirit. Externalizing anger will make us less effective in our attempts to create change and forge connection. It's an emotion that we need to transform into something life-giving. Courage, love, change, compassion, justice. Or sometimes anger can mask a far more difficult emotion, like grief, regret or shame. And we need to use it to dig into what we're really feeling. Either way, anger is a powerful catalyst for our life-sucking companion. I think it's important to have this conversation about anger. Because as Brene says, and Alison, it can be a very confronting, difficult emotion to watch in others. But what I'm hoping to share here is that they're both saying we need to give our children, even ourselves, space to express even these challenging, uncomfortable emotions. The emotion itself is okay. It's not the problem. Sometimes the problem is how we express those emotions, and that's where we need to talk about boundaries. But always validating your own emotions and others. It's okay to be angry. It's not okay to hit or break things, but it's okay to be angry. How else can we be angry and express that in a more healthy way? I'm going to refer now to an article in Perspectives on Giftedness, Sound Advice from Parents and Professionals, a recent publication by GHF, and we've had a couple of authors on the podcast from this book. It's a really fabulous book. There's an article in there called The Heartbreak of Angry Gifted Kids by Ginny Cotchus and is very relevant to our conversation today. She says, want to have your heart broken? Take a close look at an angry gifted kid. Angry kids don't want to be angry. They don't want to lash out, hurt feelings or be rude. In my children's experience, it's a symptom of a larger problem. They aren't hateful, spiteful, or the least bit vindictive. They're actually caught in the throes of an emotional trigger and unable to manage those feelings they're experiencing. And that very much backs up what we've heard from Alison and Brene. 
Ginny goes on to talk about some common emotional triggers for angry, gifted kids. She says anxiety, perfectionism, and introspection can be triggers. Introspection being gifted kids knowing that they are different. They know that they stand out and they know people make assumptions about them. And that loneliness can be really hard. That expectation can be really hard. And that can lead to feeling angry. Children might also be triggered by that heightened sense of justice or injustice in the world. That overwhelming frustration when they sense someone has been wronged. I feel that a little as a grown up, to be perfectly honest, on a regular basis. Gifted kids have a great degree of empathy. Some soak it up tension like a sponge, and that can be a trigger for anger as well. She says also impatience. It's difficult to keep your cool when the rest of the world can't keep up. So there can be many triggers for anger. And as Brene says, there can be many emotions underlying anger. So it's worth taking some time to try and unwrap what is going on. But also bearing in mind that these big meltdown moments, as Alison says, are like a build-up of overload from the world. So sometimes what actually triggers in the moment is like that straw breaking the camel's back. There might be a, a trigger in the moment, but actually it's, it's been building up for quite a while and, and, and just kind of leading to this moment. And the trigger is, I just can't take it anymore. And you get this meltdown. You know, recently for our kids, we're at the end of term one. It's been a really long term. For us here, we've had a lot of disruption from COVID. And there's been all sorts of things going on that have made it a challenging term. And that kind of tension has built. And as the term went on, resilience can lower. So sometimes it's worth keeping in mind these meltdown moments within the broader context of what's been going on and, and help to look at it both within that broader context and also any immediate triggers. And this leads us on to perfectionism and those unreasonable expectations we have of ourselves. And our children have as well. And I want to lead into a little excerpt from a podcast I did with Emily Kircher Morris, where she talks about perfectionism. Let's listen to that now. So to me, perfectionism is it's an anxiety-based response to feeling as though there, there's an expectation that somebody's not going to live up to. But that can look in like a lot of different things. I think sometimes parents are shocked when you might be talking about their child who is not only a mess, like at home and has all of these things and is maybe also having difficulty getting their homework turned in when you talk about the fact that it's some perfectionism that's maybe <laughs> you know, yeah. like like feeding some of that. But it, it doesn't always look like as somebody who is an overachiever or somebody who is constantly trying to get all straight A's. It can look like that, but it can also look like somebody who is avoidant in their approach to tasks or somebody who really is just worried about how other people perceive them. And so then they try to mask or hide what might be perceived as deficits. That little excerpt was from our podcast number 41, Perfectionism, Diagnosis and her new book with Emily Kircher Morris. Perfectionism comes up a lot within the gifted community. And it was at the very heart of this question today. Perfectionism fueling the meltdown, those unrealistic expectations. So it's an important thing to consider. And one of the best definitions I've come across about perfectionism is, again, from Brene Brown. And this is what she says. The definition that best fit the data is that perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect, live perfectly, work perfectly, and do everything perfect, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. So perfectionism is all about the appearance of fitting in, looking perfect, living perfect, working perfectly, 
being perfect. So why? Why why is that need to feel perfect? It's because fundamentally we don't feel as though we are enough. And so Brene says it's all about those painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. And so if we have a look at what shame is, and I want to read this little excerpt from Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. She says, connection, along with love and belonging, is why we are here. And it is what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Shame is the fear of disconnection. It's the fear that something we've done or failed to do, an ideal that we've not lived up to, or a goal that we've not accomplished, makes us unworthy of connection. I'm unlovable. I don't belong. Here's a definition of shame that emerged from my research. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging, and connection. Shame thrives on secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put shame into a petri dish and douse it with th those three things, it will grow exponentially into every corner and crevice of our lives. So what Brene Brown is saying, that perfectionism is all about this fear that we're not worthy of love and it's underlined with this shame that we are flawed and unworthy of love, belonging and connection because ultimately the one thing that we all want is love and connection. That's why that is. It's why we're here. And kids are no different and adults are no different. And this actually leads interestingly on to a conversation that I had in a podcast with Dr. Matt Zacresti about imposter syndrome. So bear with me a minute here and you'll see the connection. Imposter syndrome is that syndrome where you feel like you're going to get found out for being a fraud. Like literally someone's going to knock on the door and go, you're a fraud, you're pretending to be an accomplished, you know, individual that's doing life well, but actually we all know that you're faking it. That's basically imposter syndrome. Initially, there was research about high-performing women on Wall Street. And the research showed that even though these women were like experts, really high performers, totally on top of their game, the women felt like they were a fraud and they were going to be found out for not really knowing what they were doing. They could never actually claim that accomplishment. And in our conversation with uh, Dr. Matt, he talks about how that comes from a place of being other, so being different. So in that case, they were women in an industry that was very masculine. And so that contributed to them feeling this like a fraud in that environment. So if you think about our gifted community, we are constantly feeling different. Uh, you know, our kids from an early age know that they're different. And so this idea of being found out in, you know, that environment is, is a strong sense. And it comes back down to this idea that we're not enough that we're a fraud and, and we're going to get found out. And so it, this is all mixed in with those high, unrealistic expectations. We're going to start shifting this conversation to, well, what can we do about all this? We've got some great tips there from Alison about meltdowns and what we can do and the approach that we can take about meltdowns. But what do we do about all this other stuff? The anger, the perfectionism, the shame, the imposter syndrome, that feeling of not being enough. And there are some really great snippets from this conversation with Dr. Matt that I want to share with you because that's going to shift us to now thinking about, well, what can we do? What can we do about all this? So let's check that out. Yeah. And the kids would think, but how do I manage my anxiety around that? It's like you grit your teeth and you climb the two minute mountain. 
Mm -hmm. Because when we start something new, when we try to do a committed action, our anxiety is highest for 90 seconds. When we start a thing, there's 90 seconds of very intense anxiety. Mm -hmm. And like, and if you can survive that 90 seconds, mm -hmm. you're going to be okay. Yep. But you got to climb the two minute mountain. That's what it is. It's this, like you're sitting down and you, you pull out your manuscript and you're, you're writing some words and then you start to feel anxious and you go, well, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just go back and I'll make sure everything. And then you just say, okay, this is my two minute mountain. I have to keep writing for two minutes and then that feeling is going to go away. And you just, I'm just going to go away. And then like, you look up and two minutes have passed and you're like, okay, I survived that. I can keep going. You know, that's right. That's such a, and making yourself aware of that process, the physiological response to anxiety going down. Yeah. Making yourself aware of that is actually another part of curing this because, you know, like for, I've given, I don't know, about a hundred talks on giftedness and it's my favorite part of my job. And every single time I do, I have this rule of imposter syndrome. <laughs> Like I'm going to log on and there's going to be nobody there. And just a <laughs> sign on the zoom that says, we figured out that you're a fraud, get out of here. And I'm like, ah, they finally caught me. Ah, I've been, you know, I've done so well. And that hasn't happened yet. And knock wood that it's never going to happen. I don't think it's going to. Every time I start talking, every time I get into the flow, about halfway through, I sort of take a moment. And I reflect like, okay, I'm doing a pretty good job at this, right? I'm in the moment I'm doing the thing. And in those moments where I reflect, my imposter syndrome is silent because it's not real. Mm -hmm. I think there's a quote for today. It's not right? real. Yeah, it's not real. It's not real. So it's not real. And we just couldn't do the thing for two minutes. Two minutes. Like, the feel mountain. the feels, grit for two minutes, get uh, over the hump. Yeah, just right. proper grit, two yep. minutes, and then... And then that's, that's the hard bit. I mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doing the thing is the biggest antidote to imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Because imposter syndrome is anxiety and anxiety mm -hmm. just wants us to stand still. Anxiety wants mm -hmm. us to do nothing. Yeah. Committed action is this, hey, you know what? That loud voice in my head is screaming, you're an imposter, you're an imposter, you're an imposter. But you know what? I put some paint on a canvas today. I ran today. I practiced my oboe today. I surfed today. I filled out my online application for uni today. I did those things today. It doesn't untangle, it doesn't make imposter syndrome go away. But every time you take a concrete action, its grip on you gets a little bit less. And that's a very cool thing. And so I tell the kids I work with, Good can be the enemy of great. That's a true thing, right? But great can be the enemy of done. And sometimes we need to just get things done. Einstein. So yeah, that, that's cool. And I totally get that. And I think uh, where I have come across a similar idea is I think sometimes an expectation uh, amongst parents of gifted children that their gifted child, because they're gifted, therefore they always have to be, uh, you know, excelling kind of exponentially. They're, they're always have to be in that upward trajectory when the truth is we all need to cruise sometimes and plateau. And it's and that's important for consolidation and, and integrating what we've just had a leap on. And yeah, that idea of, yeah, we can't be great all of the time. We do need that sort of time out just to consolidate and be normal humans and, and, and do the life thing for a bit. That was three little snippets from Overcoming Imposter Syndrome with Dr. Matt Zakreski. I love that idea that good can be the enemy of great, but great can be the enemy of done. I have absolutely had to embrace getting it done to, to do this whole podcast thing. I am 100% a reformed perfectionist and something that I have worked long and hard on. And I have to compromise a lot. I would love for all of this to be perfect, but 
I have three kids. I have three gifted kids. I have a very busy, full life and I have to just get it done. And so I love Dr. Matt's advice because it's simply taking action. The best thing we can do when we're not feeling enough because imposter syndrome, perfectionism, shame, it's all rooted in this idea that we're not enough just as who we are. But when we take action, like he says, just two minutes of grit to take that action, to do that little bit to start that process will get us over that hump of uncomfortable emotion. And ultimately, it's not real. I love that. This episode with Dr. Matt actually was incredibly useful for me. And since then, I have taken action and I have just sat in that it's not real. And it's actually allowed me to let go of, of a lot of that old sense of imposter syndrome and just kind of embrace who I am, what I have to offer in all of its imperfection and my niche within this world and my role within it. And I think they're the sort of things that we need to start teaching our kids early on. It's kind of like, we don't need to be perfect. It's hard when you're gifted and things come easily. So we need to find those places where we can practice whilst feeling safe, that uncomfortable feeling of not being able to do it immediately. And it's actually, it's like a muscle. This was a huge challenge for one of our children. And it took some time to build that muscle. And we started with very small things. For example, you can start with something as simple as playing fish or quick card games or quick games where you might win or you might lose, but it happens quickly and over and over again. So you're just kind of practicing in that moment. Can you snap and get two cards? No, someone else got it. I didn't get it. It's okay. We're moving on. You know, there might be another card. It could be my turn. And, and these tiny little things help to build that muscle of feeling uncomfortable and in that space. And I love that, you know, what Alison was talking about at the beginning of the podcast is very much around that feeling of safety. And I actually ask myself a lot uh, of late, and I guess probably over this last year in particular, how can I help my children to feel safe? And that can happen in different ways. So Alison was talking to us about how the world is very overwhelming and that overruns our nervous system. And fundamentally, it makes our body, our brain not feel safe. And it's that not feeling safe that shifts us into that survival mode of fight, fr fright, freeze or fawn. And when we're in that survival mode, you know, the frontal lobe kind of turns off. And we're in those kind of instinctive places. So we can't be reasonable. So to, to move out of that, it's like, how do we feel safe? How do we incorporate that sense of safety into our lives on a daily basis? So slowing down, providing space in our life to just be, to rest, to quietly do quiet activities that are nurturing our nervous system. Regulating activities like swinging and exercising and music. Obviously, Alison Davies, she's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to using music to help regulate. And helping regulate, when we say that, what we're actually meaning is returning our body to that feeling of safety. That's what regulation is. So how can we nurture and help our children to feel loved? How can we connect them to the emotions that they're feeling? I came across an app a couple of years ago called the Mood Meter, and I'll put a link in the show notes for it. It was a couple of bucks, so it wasn't expensive. And it's really interesting because it maps all of these emotions and it can help you identify that. And I actually translated that app to this big board. And I have like a hundred emotions on this board 
and we've got comfortable, uncomfortable, high energy, low energy. And, and we often get that out and kind of go, well, where are we all today? Where are we all starting from in our day? Or it's the end of the day. Where, how are we all feeling? So, you know, this is what Brene Brown's talking about. It's that emotional literacy. Because in order to act and implement those feelings of safety, I think sometimes we need to know where we're starting from. Are we starting from feeling good? Or are we starting from feeling depleted and sad and exhausted? So I want to return to the article that we discussed earlier. Ginny Cotches's article, The Heartbreak of Angry Gifted Kids, from the book Perspectives on Giftedness, Sound Advice from Parents and Professionals by GHF Press. And in that article, she's actually got a lovely little list of ideas. She says, a child's angry outburst is a cry for help. And as parents, we're responsible for passing on the coping skills that will help our children thrive. And she suggests, tell your child the realities about perfectionism. Help them see perfection as perseverance, as becoming the person they're created to be. Teach and model emotional awareness. Talk through your own patterns of escalation, how you work to disarm yourself. Set firm limits. Use phrases such as, I know you're angry right now and it's okay to be angry, but hitting, kicking, throwing, etc. isn't okay. She says to accentuate the positive, find and celebrate the moments your child exhibits positive emotional regulation. We've really been working on this as a family of late. And it's, you know, often children only hear our feedback when they're doing something wrong. And it's really important to notice when they're exhibiting the behaviors which we like. And so it's as simple as saying, you know, you showed great generosity when you shared that with your sister. And, and just noticing and labeling what they did. You were so compassionate when you helped your brother when he fell over. You were so thoughtful when you brought me that because you thought I wanted it. So it's kind of naming and recognizing these moments. So, you know, they're getting more of those positives than the negatives. Teach empathy. Model empathetic behavior, especially when it comes to your child's emotions. Oh, yeah, we definitely all need to be very empathetic for each other because we all have those moments. And I think it's really great modeling because it's not that we can't have big emotions as parents. That's just not realistic, but it's what we do with those. And it's a great opportunity for us to model what it is we want our kids to do. So I will often say, mommy is feeling frustrated or I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm feeling tired. And then I'll just say, I could really use your help to do this. Or is it okay if we turn the music down? Or if you watch that in your room? Or is it, can you go bounce outside for five minutes? You know, it's communicating where we're at as parents, because that's what we want our kids to do. We want them to identify their emotions and then find those next actions. Jenny goes on to say, offer an arsenal of calming tools, movement, journaling, music, etc. And we have actually a bag of calming tools in the car that we use as a way of regulating on our way home from school. Because even a good day at school sometimes can require, you know, energy and kids can feel depleted at the end of the day. Sometimes that's quite dramatic. And we actually incorporate ways of regulating before we get into the car, like a short work or run over there and back, see how quick you can do it, that kind of thing. And then when we get in the car, crunchy food is always nice. And then all sorts of kind of uh, fidget spinners and, and those kinds of things to, to help regulate. But journaling is excellent. And if you've got a child who is open to that, We've tried it numerous times. It's something that I keep kind of introducing. And even at its basic level, it's just as simply as saying, here's some pens and pencils. Let's just maybe write on this paper. Maybe just use the colors that express the way that you feel 
And that's the beginning of the journaling process because a journaling is basically writing down, you know, what we're internalizing to externalize it. So, you know, for a younger child, especially gifted kids that don't actually like to do a lot of writing, it might be as simple as drawing those pictures, just using those colors to express themselves. And they're great skills to help build that journaling muscle, which is a really excellent tool throughout life for processing things and emotional regulation. Uh, Jenny goes on to say, provide opportunities for choice and ownership. Help your child make amends for things said and done in anger and teach them to view it as a positive step. There, there was a phrase I came a lot of, across a few years ago, and it was, you'll remember next time. And it's quite empowering because it'll be uh, something, say something has happened. Um, oh, you spilled your drink, but you didn't clean it up. Let's get a cloth now. And because this is what we would want to do. And you'll remember next time. Because that kind of says to the child of any age, really, <laughs> um, it's a work in progress. You might not have got it right this time, but there are opportunities to get it right in the future. And that's what we're working on. It's about the journey. So you'll remember next time is a really great uh, sort of reassuring phrase to use. Jenny goes on to say, work on a growth mindset to ease the fear of failure. Front load the reality of a situation to avoid meltdowns over unmet expectations. Talk to the adults, coaches, teachers, etc., who are involved in your kids' lives. Encourage your children to do the same. So there's a lot in that. We will often have a conversation, for example, if we arrive at a park especially if I'm there with my three children, I will often do exactly that, front load the situation, go, right, <laughs> how many grown-ups are there? And they'll go, one, how many kids are there? And they'll go, three, and okay, okay, so we need to stay safe. I need to be able to see you. What other things might we need to do? And I get them involved in just sort of the practical things. And obviously we've done, gone through this routine a number of times, so the kids will, you know, uh, come back with the boundaries and that kind of thing. And it's just kind of, I do, do that a lot with my kids as we prepare for something, arrive somewhere. I just kind of set that expectation at the beginning. And that's simply saying, these things are okay. You can do these things. These things are not okay. If we go to some place that's really crowded, I always remind them that we can go and look at anything you want to look at, but we need to do that together. If you see something you want to look at, don't just go look at it because we need to stay safe. Let me know and we can go look at that together. So this is what you can do. This is what we can't do. And that can help in all those situations. So there's a lot of ideas there. Modeling is really great. Setting those limits and modeling emotional awareness, uh, talking through the realities of the situation and perfectionism and definitely growth mindset. We did a podcast with Alexandra who is the founder of our growth mindset journal and I just want to share this snippet as we close this episode um, on some ideas for growth mindset. I, would, I always say start with your language because the, the way that you speak with your child is probably one of the most important things. And it is how you speak about themselves, how you speak about yourself in front of them, other people, and also like events and, and mistakes and, and failures and whatever is happening throughout the day and how you share your experiences. So language is how humans learn and uh, make sense of the world. So for example, let's say if you're in your audience, people have gifted children and especially when they when they just realize that, that some things are very easy for them and, and they're just, you know, get things very fast and have highest grades in the class. Like when you know that you can, your goal should be help them develop the growth mindset. So how do you do that? How do you speak about the achievements to them? And like the main, I would say, 
concept, one of the main concepts of growth mindset is that the end result doesn't really matter. And what matters is the process and how you got there. And if even Carol Dweck, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck was saying is that if your child got something right and it was easy for them, there's, and, and you, you know that it was easy for them. It's not something to celebrate, so to say. It, it is an opportunity. It's, it's a realization that what they're doing now is not up for the, up to their capabilities. They are, they're capable of much more. And that's your job to give them tasks and give them more challenging tasks, give them like assignments that stretch their abilities. Because at the end of the day, the end result, their A grade or their 100% test it's not as important as the actual stretching of the mind. And so when you realize that and when you explain it to them and you treat the end result, the success versus failure, like the same, but make emphasis on how they got there, how they stretched themselves, what have they learned? Uh, maybe they learned that it was too easy, right? So that's also uh, you know, helpful information. So they can, you can say, okay, well, let's find something more challenging. Let's look into this. Let's look into that. And when you approach life like that, it's, it's just the main result is a learning, is learning. And we also say, okay, help them achieve learning goals instead of achievement goals. Instead of saying, let's get in 100% on this test or let's, how can I, what can I learn in this process? And how can I skill, build my skills? And gifted or not, your child is not born with all skills available, right? So there's always something to learn and help them understand what skills will be helpful for them to in the future. Today we have been through quite a journey and that final snippet was from Alexandra Idens, the founder of the Big Life Journal and talking about growth mindset in our podcast episode number 10. We started off today with this question of my child just had this big meltdown and, and it was all very angry and they had these unrealistic expectations of themselves and perfectionism and like, help, what can I do? And so where I hope we are finishing today is that you now understand what meltdowns are all about, what that process is all about and why that behavior comes from where the brain is at in terms of feeling overwhelmed and that it's actually the brain going into survival mode. And so we need to kind of let meltdowns happen, as Alison Davies says, and when that person is coming out of that meltdown, be there for them with love and support, not kind of shame and punishment. So hopefully we've got a, a better understanding and a bit of a mindset shift about what meltdowns are all about. We've also dived into well, what is anger all about, perfectionism, how does that relate to imposter syndrome, and at its core, it's that sense that we're not enough, that fear of we're not good enough to belong, we're not lovable. And so how do we make our children feel safe? What are some of the simple things we can do just to address that sense of safety? For all of us, really, because that's what helps our nervous system to regulate. And so it might be as simple as I will usually sit with my kids when they fall asleep because one of my children said, I feel safer. So it's like, okay, that seems like a simple, easy thing to do. And yeah, sometimes it's a bit of a drag because really I want to have a cup of tea and wind down, but it's 15 minutes usually, sometimes longer. But that is kind of like they're still needing that sense of safety even at that point of the day. How can I help them feel safe during the day at home, our environment, creating that space in our life so there is just space to regulate, calm, do things that are enjoyable, incorporate more music, as Alison Davies says, to help us regulate. And then finally, what can, we, what can we do to help us work through perfectionism? And we've had a look at a whole bunch of different tools and strategies and things to think about, things that we can incorporate into our parenting to build that muscle of resilience, that muscle of imperfection, 
and setting more realistic expectations of ourselves, feeling like we're enough ultimately on a day-to-day basis. And as we manage that day-to-day basis better, in theory, the meltdown should lessen. Because if we're feeling more regulated, we're feeling safer, then we should have less need for the big meltdowns. We've had lots of great snippets from a bunch of different podcasts today. I've included all of those links of all the books, all the podcasts in the show notes. So if you're listening to someone there thinking, I want to listen to more on that, it's an easy click and they're all there ready for you. I hope that you have enjoyed today's episode. I hope that's taken you on a bit of a journey and it's given you something to think about. Please let me know. I would love to hear your thoughts on whether this was helpful. You can find us on, at ourgiftedkids.com and there is a free course there. There's free eBooks and a bunch of resources, or you can join us on Facebook or Instagram or even in our Facebook group. So I hope to see you soon and let me know what are your thoughts? What are your tools and strategies uh, for perfectionism or emotions or meltdowns? I'd love to hear them. Enjoyed Bye. this episode and it inspired you in some way i'd love to hear about your biggest takeaway in the comments for more episodes you can subscribe and to help others find our podcast please leave a review you can find show notes and more resources at ourgiftedkids.com and connect with us on facebook and instagram see you in the same place next week